Hi, I'm Joe. And I'm Liz. This is Joe's Table, where we talk about role-playing, game design, hobbies, project planning, world building, and all things creativity. Today, who boy. Oh, no. Flame War time. Yep. Today we, we're going to talk about D&D. We figured we should get this episode out of the way pretty early on, because it's going to give you kind of a window into our feelings about D&D, and we'll also be very important for some of the later episodes we do about other game systems. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about D&D. Do we have to? Yeah, we kind of do. So, we've played a lot of D&D. I mean, may, I guess not so much recently, but mm-hmm. we've, we've between the two of us, we've participated in D&D from 2nd edition to 5th edition. Uh, we have books for all the editions, going back to AD&D, we don't have the blue book, I think, is no. what we're missing. But, I mean, you know, very few people have actually played blue book, blue book D&D, so I'm not super worried about that. <laughs> um, so the th- we've, we've played 2nd edition, 3rd, 3.5, 4th, 5th edition. We've played Starfinder. We've, I've played a little tiny bit of Pathfinder. We've, uh, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of stuff in the tradi- what I would call the traditional games bag. And we both started with D and D. That was both our first role playing game experience. It's both very nostalgic for us, but also problematic. Right. We don't want you to come into this thinking that we hate D and D. What we're trying to say here is that we love D and D. Like, I th- I feel I th- I feel like if we had to pick one system to have on a desert island. D&D would be tied for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not the first system we'd have. Yeah. But it's up there, right? Like, it's it's really hard to say, like, we we don't want to play D&D anymore, right? I think that we totally both would play some more D&D. We just have to get past some of our problems with it. Well, and part of the issue with it is D&D doesn't fit our play style. And I think that's a really important thing to talk about. Right is what playstyle D&D is meant for and what different playstyles there are out there and where we fall in that spectrum. Right. So, let, I mean, just for just for the, the, the a broad overview, let's talk about the GNS theory buckets of games. GNS. Uh, oh, uh, that's the abbreviation. Yes, that is. And, uh, the, the, the abbreviation is gamist, uh, narrativist, and simulationist. So the, in this, like, this is a kind of a high abstract kind of uh, highfalutin game theory type of design structure but it 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 helps at least put things in buckets the buckets go like this there there are gamest games or gamest behaviors in games where you are trying to win right Mm -hmm. where you're trying to use the mechanics of the game successfully and effectively in order to win the game in order to to do well at the game itself then there are narrativist behaviors in games where you're not so much constricted by the rules of the game and you're more focused on what the story is or what the characters mm-hmm. are like right the more kind of storytelling ish aspect of it and then you've got the simulationist behaviors of the game where you've got things in the game that are trying to emulate things in the real world as much as possible um, and those those three buckets occur in every role playing game to some extent or another. What it really comes down to is which bucket a game fits best into, because those are the behaviors that you're going to be executing the most in that game. And so for us, we're really narrative um, role players. We want to tell a story. We want to be part of a story. We want to see the big world and what's going on in it and, you know, have an influence in that and really get swept away, you know, with the story and everything that's going on with it. Absolutely. But the the problem I think is that D and D for, for all of the narrative behaviors that we'd see in it, because we see a lot of narrative behaviors in it. Mm -hmm. It is fundamentally itself, mostly a gamist kind of game. And I think pretty strong evidence of that is, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, is that 
you can actually spend a whole bunch of time in D&D trying to make the perfect character for the situation that you're in. Whereas in a narrative game, that wouldn't matter as much. Right. Yeah, there, there, are, there are some earmarks of uh, heavily gamist, um, biased games, uh, of, of the behaviors that you see in gamism as a, as a behavior pattern. Um, and those, those, pa- those patterns are things like having to optimize your character and uh, spending a lot of time going over how your character works. And, um, and I, I happen to be looking uh, past Liz right now at some vampire sheets uh, on the printer uh, behind her because we were going to just run some random vampire the masquerade um, one 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 shots, and uh, I'm thinking about how those are just spectacularly different to build from a D and D character, where you need to like research your feats, research all of these synergies and things. You do a, a, a bit of synergizing in vampire, but like just not even remotely close to the amount. The other thing that that is a very clear earmark of D and D being a very gamist role playing game is that the entire first book almost the player's handbook is combat rules right like there are some utility spells you know there's probably i mean you could you could be generous and say half the half the spells are utility spells but like there's like you know maybe 20 pages or something of skills and then maybe 60 or 70 pages of utility spells and then mm-hmm. the entire rest of the 300 page book or whatever it is is mostly about building characters who are optimized for combat because that's what it is. It's a game about trying to go into dungeons and kill monsters. That's mm-hmm. that's what it's supposed to do. It's right in the title. Right in the title. It's exa- it's written on the tin. Yep. And we're not trying to be mean here. This isn't like a judgment. It, we're 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 saying that this is the kind of categories of behaviors that this game encourages because mm-hmm. that's how the rules are written. Um and yes, you can you can totally play D&D as a more narrative game. We know I that's how I learned how to play D&D because we started I started with just the monster manual and we had to make up the rules from there <laughs> until we finally got a hold of a DMG and had to make up more rules from there and then finally got a player's handbook at one point. And then we knew how to play the game. So, yes, we've done plenty of D&D games that are narrative driven. That's that's a kind of a different that's kind of like saying um yes you can drive a formula one car around downtown madison but that's not what the the thing is designed for right it's designed to go on a racetrack and drive really 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 absurdly fast mm-hmm. so that's what it's optimized for so we're going to split this podcast into three parts we're going to talk about the design of D. we're going to talk about the social aspect of D. And we're going to talk about the mechanics of D&D and how those don't work very well for a narrativist style game. Um, and may also not work very well for a game anyways, in our opinion. Um, oh, flame war commence. Woo! Here we go. So yeah, so stick with us. And we're going to start off by talking about design. So again, another another preface. Um, we, we, we are complaining. This is a bit of a rant. This, this is... This is um, the reason why we're making this series of, of podcasts is because we, we need to talk about problems that we have with D&D and why that's relevant uh, and what that means, w- how that compares to other games that we're going to talk about later on. Mm-hmm. Because we're going we're gonna to do pros and cons of a lot of different systems. I mean, not maybe a lot of different systems. We, we can only do the ones that we have played and we tend to play the same kind of stuff. Um, but... We need to talk about D and D before we can talk about a lot of the other things because it's just the elephant in the room. It's really hard to talk about role playing games without talking about D and D. So a lot of stuff in game design in this field is just going to be reactionary to D and D. Yeah, and it does make it easier since D and D is the most widely known role playing game out there to be able to make those comparisons to it for people. So getting our thoughts out about D and D and having this available first will be very helpful for those later conversations. Right, because we can always tell you um, if you come fight us on Twitter or something or on Discord, which you should totally do. Link's in the description. Um, we can always tell you, okay, go go back and, and watch uh, or listen to episode two where we talked about the design philosophy of D&D mm-hmm. um, as kind of a, a preface to any discussion that we want to have about why we disagree with something. Yep. 
All right. So getting into some of that design philosophy. Right. Enough disclaimer. Let's do this. Okay. So uh, I think one of the, my my major pet peeves of D and D is tradition. Actually, um, this is kind of weird because I kind of like traditions mm-hmm. as as a person as a, as a, as a social phenomenon. I like I like traditions, but there are some traditions in D and D that are explicitly problematic. They're they're kind of explicitly against the game design properties and philosophy of the way the game should be designed and run right so one of the I'm, this this is just sort of an archetypal example but the idea that there are things like fireball and lightning bolt that are just sort of objectively better spells in in among that level um that there can be objectively better spells of a given level is kind of against the the core conceit of there being spell levels right like if a, if one spell is better than the other shouldn't those two spells be on two different levels yeah and it really kind of invalidates all of those other spells there that it might be you know also third level but just not useful for anything except for that one strange situation right like the idea of making something like water breathing higher level because you need to lock off certain content Mm-hmm. Right. That's that's a that's a weird um, collusion of design parameters there that that is just not really it's not really fully cognizant of the the it's just not really a good employment of the design parameters that they've given themselves. Mm-hmm. So another kind of example of this is that there are monsters that are more dangerous than other monsters of the same CR. So there's, there's, you know, plenty of YouTube videos that are like casting monsters in tears and saying like, Mm -hmm. Oh, this monster is like the best second or two CR monster in fifth edition because it can kill players so easily. Well, wait a minute, right? Shouldn't, if it can kill players so easily, shouldn't it be a higher challenge rating? Isn't that the rating of the challenge? And that just makes it so much more difficult, especially for a new GM to figure out what monsters do I put up against my party? What right. what monsters do I put up against my players? Because, well, yeah, I mean, they're the same CR, but they may not actually be the same. Right. They, they can be spectacularly different in terms of the overall mm-hmm. event that occurs, right? Yeah. You, can bu- you can easily build an encounter that is quote unquote balanced mathematically by the, by the GM's uh, uh, encounter building rules that will go spectacularly different uh-huh. with from, from like having goblins versus displacer beasts or something like that. Yeah. Um, another tradition that is going to just immediately start a flame war as soon as I speak the word is alignment. Um, and yes, yes, we know there are plenty of, plenty of videos and plenty of arguments about alignment in general, but I think that what we're what we're trying to get at here is that alignment is in the game because it's tradition to have alignment in the game. Um, it's not there because it provides something useful in terms of game design. It's there because it's always been there. And I think that's that's kind of the point that we're trying to make with the tradition is the traditions of D and D have overridden good design as a game. So the next thing with traditions is. And this is something that, you know, I kind of struggle with saying is a problem or not, because on one hand, I really like honoring the folks who started D&D. Um, and so on the one hand, it's kind of nice to see their characters' names on spells um, and in other things. On items or whatever. And on items and things like that. But on the other hand, I also feel it kind of strange Um because like i don't know who that character is i don't know who that person is like they're not really written into the lore anymore other than just like as you know this one weird spell or this one right. weird item and it also makes it really difficult if you are doing a D game that's set in a different world that you've created you know who is that person to that world why right. is the spell named after them you know it just doesn't really fit in very nicely so I'm divided about it because on one hand, like honoring that tradition and honoring those origins, I think is a really nice thing to do. But on the other hand, it kind of just doesn't fit that nicely with other, you know, uses of them and just seems kind of strange. Right. I think that it kind of works when you're playing at me 
on Twitter and Discord for this this phrase, but like the naive play style of D&D where you're not specifically trying to execute some grand archetype of a game world that's like a really specific thing and you're just saying like look we're going to play in fantasy land. That's what they that's what they used to call it basically was fantasy land where they're playing in this kind of hypothetical archetypal middle European uh, medieval history that's airsatz and has magic and stuff, right? The the those kind of those kind of items and those kind of spells and stuff they work well for like what I would call generic D&D where you're not trying to articulate some specific game world. You're, you're just playing D and D. Um, so I find it interesting. Also, I don't, I don't know if you knew this, but the, because those names are copyrighted, those, those spells are renamed in the, uh, system reference documents so that you, you, you can use those spells, well, at least in third, uh, 3.5. I don't know if they even exist in fourth ed- in fifth edition, but um, in 3.5, so things like Melf's, um, Melf's Acid Arrow were just na- renamed Acid Arrow, um, and Big B's Crushing Fist were just renamed Crushing Fist. So hmm. they kind of had to extract some of that honor, <laughs> I guess, out of, out of those, those elements of the game because that's, that's their property. And I think that's mm-hmm. kind of... W- that's interesting because they are also aware that that's their property, not our property. And so they know that people are going to need to kind of extract those names out if they want to have their own world, which is kind of a weird, I don't know what to do about that problem. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything that you really should or can do about that problem. I think it's probably the most like, not problem of uh, right, problems right. with it's kind it. of a it's kind of a petty thing right yeah yeah definitely oh, but don't worry we've got some more we're gonna get so petty big scale things and yeah. petty things so let's talk about customizing a character oh man okay so what would be the cool character that you'd want to play i want to play an orcish wizard yeah yeah that would be so cool but womp womp can't do it i mean uh, you can the the so, so the, the 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 thing that we're struggling with here um, is that D and D, because of the way it's written and because of the way it's designed, it is a gamist game, and that means that your your prerogative as a player is to play the game well. Anybody who's like, well, you know, you don't have to play the game that way, is kind of saying we want to we want to bend it in a different direction than the game is designed to operate. There's there. It's almost like saying, well, you can give out money in monopoly if you really want to, you don't have to play the game by the rules. And that that's kind of a naive interpretation because the game is designed a specific way to induce you to play in a specific pattern. So, yeah, so sure. You can play an orcish wizard. You're just, it's just not going to be as good. Right. It will, it will, because of the way that the the game is written, that orcish wizard will never be the same as a wizard who is of I don't know an elf or whatever mm-hmm. is the the most optimal uh, choice for that. And we'll get into a little bit more about like the why you know choosing something like an orc instead of an elf for your wizard is problematic in a little bit here. Um, but you know part of what we're talking about here is the fact that. Yes, you've got a lot of choice in your character creation. You know, you you can choose from a whole bunch of different classes and a whole bunch of different races and, you know, 5th edition backgrounds and stuff like that, which can give your character a really interesting feel. But there's actually not that much choice there. And when you really look at it, there's not that many choices you can really pick to build a strong character who can get through a dungeon or get through a module or get through something else you know and survive and do well and so if you choose something that makes you personally happy because it's the you know character concept that you want to do it may not actually be very fulfilling or work out very well and you may end up getting really frustrated by it because it doesn't fit with how the game is played right this both this happened to us both, I think at least twice in our last Curse of Strahd game, um, where we both either died or gave up on characters just because they weren't 
designed to be optimal for the game, right? For mm-hmm. for that that particular campaign, for that particular situation that we found that we found ourselves in. So we came back with characters that were designed specifically for that and played barbarians and we smashed played, everything. We both played barbarians, yes. In the same game. In the same game. Eventually I think there were four barbarians in a party of five. But that's kind of the that's what we're that's what we're implying is what we're trying to say here is that that redu- the the optimize or fail structure of D&D re- massively reduces your choices as a player. It leaves a bunch of choices there, but those are false choices because they're 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 paths towards failure as opposed to paths towards success. There there are other things that that c- fall under the 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 context of customization too that that aren't great in D&D. Um the kind of the kind of follow along with this um optimize or fail false choices kind of behavior um for example uh what if you wanted to make a wizard whose uh whose elemental purview was wind right we tried this at one point um because we were you know building a couple of characters that we were trying to discuss trying to discover what the limits of Mm -hmm. being able to build optimal characters were and we decided decided that there just weren't enough wind spells to even make a wizard out of wind right yeah and we thought well maybe we can reskin some of the lightning or the fire spells and stuff like that but it just really didn't make sense because i don't think there was even a wind damage option so yeah we have thunder and lightning lightning and fire yeah which are not wind yeah and cold i think so yeah so you can try thunder lightning and cold but those are like, but those are not like, the, the, those are not the same kind of thing as like just being a fire wizard mm-hmm. who uses fire, right? Yeah. So we really feel like the customization that we want is just not there in D&D for the types of stories we want to tell and the types of characters we want to portray. Um, it feels like there should be, but it just really isn't there. Right. And that that does, it seems like that comes down m- mostly to the optimization problem. Mm-hmm. If you had kind of a very loosey-goosey kind of GM who is going to play softball and not, like, intentionally try to kill the players at every turn, you could probably get away with, like, a lot more flexibility in your character design. Um, but that's that, that's no guarantee. And even the GM, because of the way the game is designed, doesn't always have that kind of control over the way the combat happens. So again, you come back to optimize or fail. The only mm-hmm. successful strategy is to be good, to get good, scrub, or die, <laughs> right? And this isn't just a fifth edition issue. Right. Um, you know, I think it's good to point out that this was still a problem back in three five and third and you know other options as well. There just wasn't that ability to really customize and what, make a character that's, that's right, which broad. is which is very interesting because what 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 I find fascinating is that the the customization of your character really started in third edition, mm-hmm. right? You you didn't have back in second edition we had the the um, players option rule book which like started to give you things like non-weapon proficiencies and that we would later call skills and stuff like that um but that didn't that 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 wasn't the same level of customization that you could do to your character that happened in three in, in third edition and yet in third edition you started to have this problem where you have a lot of options but most of those options are not there there are some options that are just clearly better than other options Right. So you might have more possibilities, but fewer legitimate options that are going to be successful. Yeah. All right. So now we've talked about customization. So let's move on to modules. Now, this is also probably another immediate flame war because I know that a lot of people like to play modules because pretty much all of the people that I talk to about playing D&D are always talking about playing modules these days. Um I'm I'm not personally aware of any kind of statistics about like how many new players there are, how much bigger the market is now than it was when I started playing, or like when what, what I like our college days when I would consider that our kind of golden age of D and D. But it definitely seems a lot more popular now than it ever was mm-hmm. before. 
Um, and I think part of that owes to the fact that there are a ton of modules for 5th edition, and the 5th edition itself is just a much simpler um, system to play than, 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 a, than a lot of the previous editions. But I think that 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 is sort of, it's kind of a trap. It's kind of mm-hmm. an interesting and hard to describe um, mental trap that we've gotten ourselves into where sure you can you can pick up a module and run it and you're playing D D, but in so doing you've also kind of missed out on some of the possibilities that you could have done right some of the things that you could have um seen or or done as a gm or as a storyteller or as a player that you wouldn't necessarily get to do in a module yeah i mean modules make it really easy if you're just starting out this is your first time that you're running a game first time you're playing in a game um, it does make it really easy it does take out some of that stress of world building um it takes that off of you so you've got everything you need there you've got all the character or you know you've got all your npcs rather you've got all of your world you've got your places you've got your maps like that's already there you've got a lot of support behind it but you don't have that flexibility of you know if this was a world you build yourself and there is a set story through a module which really kind of ends up in a situation where you could end up railroading players um through the story to get to the prescribed end of the story even if there's a ton of choices there's still a prescribed end to the story that may not match up with what the players want to do and want to experience Exactly. And I, I remember um, the very words from Cody's mouth in a Taking 20 video where uh, he was talking about, he was, he was, I think he was on a jag about playing Storm King's Thunder and how he specifically was getting off book. And I thought to myself, that is so modern. That's such a weird, I've never heard anybody in the D&D community say that they're off book before. Right. And that, that the, the implication to that is that we our our campaign has has deviated too much from the module to which I mean, I say as as a, a, a grognard, like, great. Right. I don't want to play the same module a bunch of times. I want to I want to have my own story. Right. Yeah, and I think the thing I'd ask with that is, OK, so are the players having fun, though? Exactly. Do they care if they're off book? Or are they just having a blast going and right. doing whatever they want? And then that's the game that I want to play. Right. That's the game that I want to run, you know, where people don't care if you're on book or on plot or anything like that. Right. They're just having fun and experiencing a story together. Right. The implication behind that actually is that that it was a good game, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you think about it, they wouldn't be off book if they weren't enjoying the way that they were going. They would have gone back to like, oh, well, which way are we supposed to go, Cody? Yeah. That That's an example of one of the most famous GMs out there right now being drawn into the trap of, well, I have a book, so I have to follow the book, mm-hmm. right? Like that's just, that's exactly what that is. And we talked about that a little bit in our world building, how to world build podcast number two. Uh, check that one out previous to this one. Um, but yeah, that's, that's some of the, that's some of the problems that, that are endemic to uh, modules, but there are, there are some others. Yeah. Now, one of the things that Liz mentioned a, a moment ago about like the module does make a game of D and D easier to play. Um, that's true. But what I, I, I find that a little bit deceptive because you have to realize that D&D itself is actually pretty hard. It's a very mm-hmm. difficult game. Even 5th edition is actually substantially more difficult than just a vast, like a, a, a huge panoply of other tabletop role-playing games that are out there. So I always find it kind of funny in a chagrin kind of way when people are like, oh yeah, I'm a new player, a new role player, so I'm going to pick up d and I'm like, no, pick something else. There are <laughs> easier games to get into that will make you want to keep playing. So what it, what it seems like to me is that modules are frequently like a patch fix on the problem of d and is too complicated. So I need to offload some of my GM responsibilities in order to continue to mm-hmm. run the game, right? Yeah. I would rather be in a situation where I have a simpler game that's easy for me to run as the, as the GM and I can focus exclusively on making the game work, making mm-hmm. the world happen, telling the story around the players instead of having to have like a map essentially 
dictate to me how the game should go and like what I can do next so that I don't have to think about that. Definitely. Now, the other thing that we've found with modules is it's really it's a lot more difficult to actually get your players involved in oh, yeah. the story because it's not their story. Right. There's there's not that investment in the in the story. You're always looking to try to hook your players when you when you're running a, a module. You and in in more that that seems like a big problem at the beginning, but it's a problem throughout the entire campaign mm-hmm. because you it's unless you ha, unless the campaign uh, the the module is set up to like get the players invested early and then hit them with something that they will remain invested in, then you're going to be fighting that same exact battle of keeping them invested the entire campaign, right? Like mm-hmm. a lot of people will only be playing that module because it is D and D that they get to play with their friends, not because yeah. they actually want to play in that campaign world and do that, that specific task. Right. And once again, it makes it more difficult for the GM. If your players wander off and say, Hey, I'm invested in this one random NPC. And then you're like, wait, that random NPC doesn't have any plot other than like this tiny little quest that they're supposed to give here. You know, it's tiny little thing that you do. So yeah, what like do you he's do? A, he's a quest giver, not a quest. Like what, yeah. what there's no there's no content here. What, what what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, and and so you you're you're always fighting this weird battle where you're trying to um get your players backstories interwoven into the way that the campaign sets up Mm -hmm. and like you you want you you often want players who have good backstories because they want to do the role playing they want to do the 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 brain work but then those players the more like the then you you have like Mm -hmm. this diminishing returns thing where the more backstory they have the less invested they are in the campaign the module that you're running it's it's what we would call an sep somebody else's problem Frequently in these kind of modules, and in a, and in a lot of other, in a lot of world building exercises like Faerun, for example, um, some problem comes up in the Forgotten Realms, and you know the player's immediate reaction is generally like, "We'll make fucking Elminster do it, right? Like, why is he? Why has he not solved this problem already? He's the god of this world, basically, right? Like, mm-hmm. what what's what's going? What what can I offer the situation that he can't do?" And that's like a completely rational thing to think, even if like the game itself provides a bunch of reasons or explanations as Mm -hmm. to why he's not available. Like the fact that they've presented this character who can do everything and you're not him means that's not your story, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. So enough about modules. Let's get into some... Oh, geez. Yeah. Let's... Let's let's start the flame war all over again and let's talk about the baked in racism in D and D. Yeah. This is warning. This is going to be some heavy stuff, right? This is not our favorite topic to talk about. And I don't, I mean, we're, we're both white folks, mm-hmm. middle-class don't, we don't, we're not the best people to talk about this topic, but we can see problems here in D and D that are problematic. And, I think we need to talk about it. Right. Because as, if we continue not to, it's going to continue to be a problem. Right. Because of tradition. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing we want to say is bell curves exist. This this, this should this should clearly articulate the the overarching problem and and explain immediately the solution to that problem, right? Mm-hmm. The the problem is that in D&D, there are broad sweeping generalizations about groups of people. Uh-huh. Um, and those broad sweeping generalizations about groups of people are often negative in some way, especially in like the older versions of D&D. Uh, I was just looking through uh, second edition a while back and I, I had found the chart that told you what the maximum levels were in particular classes for individual races. So that like an elf can only ever become, I don't know what it was, like a 14th level fighter. But a human can become a 20th level fighter. And so that sort of thing transferred into three point or in third edition as like just, well, okay, maybe we'll just make it so that orcs are less smart than elves. And so they gave orcs like a penalty to intelligence. 
that's that's not okay. That's kind of not great, you know. No. That's that's um that's dangerous. That's a slippery slope. And even in 5th edition, while there's no negative penalties that I'm aware of for certain races, other races get positive penalty or positive not penalties, but positive um stat bonuses to them. So it's still there, it's just not there in quite the same way. Right. You're just saying rather than saying orcs are inherently stupid you're saying that elves are inherently smarter than orcs yeah and that's that comes down to the same thing it boils down to the same the same kind of thing right um what we're what we're trying to say with the bell curves exist thing is that you with with rules like that with that kind of structure of saying okay this is how races work you're really only capturing like that middle like um standard deviation of of people in the world you're saying okay we're going to reduce this entire race to people who have this trait and and disregard all the people who are either better than that or not as good as that as that right the the bell curve tails go out in the higher and lower directions um and I, you know, there, there's an argument to be made for like, well, but that's what the stats, the stat rolls are for, right? But that obfuscates that there could be an orc who's as smart as the mm-hmm. smartest elf. And it also makes it so when you're going through character creation, if you're like, I want to play a wizard, every time that I go through character creation and I'm like, I want to play X sort of thing, one of the first things I do is look for what races are good at X. Right. So it definitely factors into that. Absolutely. So if I have an interesting character idea, say like our orcish wizard, I'm just never going to do that because it's just not going to ever be as good as being right. an elven wizard. Right. Because optimize or die. Optimize or die. And the other yeah. thing about that is like, I feel like so frequently when, when somebody picks a character like that, because the environment and the culture, and we'll get to the culture of D&D and the social aspects in a later podcast, but because the social... Um, aspect the culture of D is to optimize or die other players are going to look at you if you do play the Mm -hmm. the orcish wizard and be like what's the matter with you like are you some kind of like storytelling wonk that you just want to like you're you're willing to take a hit and suck at your job in order to just have a cool backstory like what that's kind of silly isn't it we we need a wizard who can do their job yeah and like man wow hardcore harsh you know yeah (laughs) also kind of racist yeah um and, you know, when it comes to a narrativist point of view on that, like, that's the character that you'd want to play. Right. The, the, the characters that you want to play are the ones who are, are at the ends of the bell curve. Like, those, mm-hmm. are the, the, those are the characters that we find fascinating, is the ones that are exceptional and strange in some way. Yeah. And I think you can take care of some of that same sort of thing through just storytelling. You know, in your world design, you can say, orcs have a culture that's predominantly like X and, you know, highly encourage physical fitness and things like that. But there's nothing that says that they can't be anything else too. Um, I think Skyrim actually does a pretty good job at that where there's, you know, some bonuses, but they're pretty minor and you could totally be, you know, an orc wizard. It doesn't really have the same, Skyrim doesn't really have the same problem where your, your orcish fighter Mm -hmm. will Will, at, at maximum level will always be better than your elvish fighter or whatever yeah. right like that that there isn't kind of a top out problem like that in in skyrim that i'm aware of or at least not not enough that you would ever really notice it mm-hmm. the way you would in in D land cool my next skyrim character is definitely going to be an orcish wizard awesome yeah take over the college of winterhold mm-hmm. now th- that that's all well and good and i mean there are there are ways to solve that that level of the problem mm-hmm. where you can say okay well you know if you don't want to take the bonuses stat bonuses from your race you can always take the human bonuses and use that and then you know you can treat it as a skinning problem where you're like yeah. okay technically i'm a i'm an orc but i'm an orc but, but my stats are that of a human right just so that i can get the the statistics that i want to that i want to have first of all if that was the way that they wanted to treat it, if that was like a legitimate way to handle the problem, then they should put that in the book mm-hmm. because that 
by itself would go a long ways to alleviating the problem of racism in, yeah. in this, in this kind of context. Um, but they didn't. And, and more to the point, that's not the only segment of this problem. There's the whole, the whole world is kind of built out of this broad sweeping generalizations thing where everybody, like all these groups with the like possible exception of elves and humans of specific mm-hmm. social groups are put into these buckets where it's like all these characters are like this. All these other characters are like this. And I get like, you don't want to have to have <laughs> build height and weight ratio, like percentile die uh, charts for like imps and um, dragons and uh, dragon turtles and in displacer beasts and invisible stalkers and all that stuff. That's not really what we're talking about. What we're, what we're, what we're after is more of like the, the broad sweeping generalizations about characters that are important in the story that are like sapient. Mm -hmm. Right. And saying like sapience is kind of the, the thing that we, that we value. And that once you, once you have the quality of sapience, once you're a person, now you can say, like, I'm going to make the decision to be as... Mm-hmm. I'm an elf, but I'm going to make the decision to make myself as strong as an orc. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work out every day. I'm going to join the um, Orcish Princeton Club or whatever. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm gonna you know, tank up. I'm going to mm-hmm. get shredded. And I'm going to name my elvish fighter Shredded Beef. And that's how I'm going to play my game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that that should be available to the players. Yeah. And I think also like there's a kind of a representation problem there too of like why not have some NPCs why not have some NPCs in the world in all these places that are representations of that? Why not have Shredded Beef the Elf like running a orcish war college or something mm-hmm. somewhere? Like those are the kinds of like what that's what we're saying is like those are those the, those are the outliers on the bell curve that are interesting because they're outliers. Those are the characters you're going to remember. Right. Yeah. So I think what's even more egregious for me within all of this is the alignment and how alignment gets factored in with different factions as well and how it is just kind of painted across the entire group. And I'm right. thinking of Drow specifically when mm-hmm. I say this. Um, we were looking through one of the 5th edition adventure modules that features Drow and the name of it's escaping me right now. And... You know, I was thinking about the fact that drow, with, you know, one notable exception I can think of, are always said to be, you know, some evil alignment, um, which just doesn't seem right to me to say that an entire race, an entire species is just inherently evil. Once again, you're going to have that bell curve of, you know, some folks are probably not evil. Some folks are probably a lot more evil, but to just tar a whole group with that brush of evil you know or saying that everybody in a certain group is always good you know and ascribing alignments to races and species is just really uncomfortable right and i feel like it it, that that's a problem that seems like it could be fairly easily remedied if you wrote an entire an entire edition of D &D like i wouldn't say correctly but like it, it, with with that in mind you could mm-hmm. you could very easily say rephrase that to be like the l or the drow of this you know social group mm-hmm. are are generally evil because of these things yeah. right because they believe in these things making it about the reasons that we're going to say that they're evil mm-hmm. as opposed to just broadly painting them with that one brush that says evil yeah And yeah, you know, being able to do that makes it really easy once again for the GM to, you know, find an NPC and say, oh, well, you see a drow up ahead, you know, they're evil. Right. You know, it makes it super easy to do that. But that's also a very, very bad slippery slope that we've gone through this in real life. Why are we doing this in a game? And I think as a GM, it's actually more interesting for me to like look up. Mm hmm. Say say that I'm in that situation, and instead of uh, the book saying "drow, comma always evil" or "always what is it lawful evil" probably yeah I don't know. something like always that. lawful evil, 
that the book would say, like, drow, usually from the Church of Lolth evil organization, mm-hmm. right? That's a, that's a very different thing that I could be like, okay, well, is he from that same organization? What do I know about that organization? How evil <laughs> did they generally be? Yeah. Like, what? Did, why are we saying that they're evil, right? So now I've got, that's like, what is that? Like five or six questions that have just popped mm-hmm. up into my head about this character that are all fodder for making that character more interesting than an evil drow appears on the road, do you shoot him? Right, yeah. And it also gives you more variety, too, as a GM to, like, you know, you've got a drow who's from the, you know, Church of Wolf or, you know, you know some sort of an eagle, evil organization and the characters encounter this one drow and have a bad experience with them. But then you have another drow that they encounter later who's not part of that right. group. They're going to act differently now because of their first encounter. Exactly. And that that's a lot of good conflict to pull right. on. And that also even opens that question of like, do we want to deal with the the possibility that your characters might have preconceptions now because mm-hmm. of that? Or are we just going to assume that you guys' characters are generally pretty stand-up people and don't mm-hmm. really like take the preconceptions of the last guy mm-hmm. that happened to look the same yeah. and apply that to the next person that they meet? Or are you all murder hobos and you don't care? Right. You killed the guy even though he was provably good and everybody knew that and we were yeah. all on the same page anyway. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like donating his entire life savings to a church, but that's okay. Let's just kill him anyway. Let's just kill him anyway. I feel like there's there's a there's an interesting subset of this question where you're talking about the alignment of creatures that aren't sapient or mm-hmm. are less sapient than humans. Um, and like... Is it okay to like, so I don't know what, what's a good example. Are Umber Hulks intelligent? I don't know. Assume, uh, imagine that we have something like an Umber Hulk that's intelligence is three. It's not really a sapient creature, but it's smart. It's as smart as an animal. Um, If an, if, is it, if, if all, if generally speaking, all the Umber Hulks like want to find humanoids and kill them, Mm -hmm. is it okay to label them with the always, always chaotic evil brush? Or is it like, we still need to talk about the possibility that some Umber Hulks are, you know, gun shy and will like just scutter if they, if they see people in their tunnels or whatever. Are lions evil because they kill gazelle? Right. Yeah. So I think we're getting back to the whole, um, the actual flame war of alignment is problematic in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should like take a moment to say that like, We've, we've, we've run games where alignment has been important and we've run games where it hasn't been important. And I think my, personally my favorite treatment that I can remember of actually using alignment in D&D was one time I, and I deci- we were running a game about demons and demon hunters and I decided that instead of alignment being what your, a descriptive term about what your character's actions have been or are likely to be, um, instead it was actually, the, it was like a, platonic atomic system where beings were made up of good evil law and chaos and so demons happened to be mostly made up of evil stuff and that's why spells affected them different than uh affecting mortals or angels differently um and that was interesting to me because there were a bunch of demons who were good in that campaign and a bunch of angels who were bad and like a bunch of people who were kind of in the middle and like were be able to evade spells because they were like well my alignment atoms in my body are mostly law, so I can dodge these spells. So separating alignment from morality. Yeah, that's kind of what we did. And I know, obviously, that's, that's pretty much as, as far from using alignment the way it's supposed to be used mm-hmm. as possible. But, like, I, I don't know. It's just, that is a, that's a real big ball of wax, and I don't know that, mm-hmm. I don't know that it's as useful a... It is definitely not as useful of a, of a design parameter mm-hmm. as, as other components of D and D are. Yeah. We could do without it. We have yeah. it because it's traditional. Yep. All right. And the last thing we want to talk about is the fact that D and D is limited, um, in that there are certain lore and certain concepts that you can't really bring into it. Um, so it, does make it so that you can't translate some worlds and some properties and some things that you may want to run a game about into it. It just doesn't have that flexibility. Right. Like a good, a good, a good example might be 
like a demigod. In mm-hmm. in many hero myths from all over the world, there are demigods as mm-hmm. the heroes, right? And D and D is not very good at dealing with that kind of stuff. Like saying that a first level adventurer is significantly more powerful than like a commoner with a stick mm-hmm. isn't generally speaking very easy to do in D&D because we have levels and things. There are just what we're saying is like the design parameters of D&D require a certain kind of story archetype and character archetypes. And some some character archetypes that you think of that you would be like, "Man, it wouldn't be wouldn't it be cool to play like I don't know, a, a, a Final Fantasy style summoner who summons giant beasts to deal damage or something." That's not that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's nope. just not in the cards. Like there's no amount of homebrewing that you can do. Right, that's going to make that okay. Right. You yeah. could totally make it happen, but it's not going to be balanced. It's just that's just yeah. not how it how it be. Another example might be like how the dynamics of something like Fate Stay Night worked where you've got mm-hmm. almost two different um casts of power mm-hmm. levels where you know some 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 characters are just just massively better and on like a different playing field than other characters and then um how those two groups of people interact yeah that's that's not going to happen very easily in D&D unless I mean you could try splitting the party but nobody's going to enjoy that nobody's going to be like yeah I want to play the level 4 guy while the servants are like level 15 you know like nah nah it's just not going to happen <laughs> not going to fly I mean you I mean, that feels like one of the closest things you could cludge together in D&D yeah. because you could have somebody who's level 4 and then somebody who's level 15 and well but think about know. like you, you and I have have flexibility in how we would deal with rules mm-hmm. about that but like the the game itself is going to be really hard on that kind of thing because yeah. of how challenge ratings work and how experience points work, you know, and and encounter building and all that stuff. The rest of the game is going to be really, really complicated to deal with mm-hmm. that. Yeah, definitely. One of my other favorites as an example of this is actually bullet hell games. I like to mm-hmm. play a good Donmaku occasionally, and I'm not good at them by any stretch of the <laughs> imagination, but like the, I, I just really like high fantasy where it's like super magic power, right? Mm-hmm. That I can fire like billions of these projectiles at a time and be up against like continent sized bad guys and stuff. That, that is just straight up never going to happen in D&D. I mean, what the best you can get is what, nine magic missiles at the same time or I something guess. like that I mean, yeah i don't know i'm sure somebody has homebrewed like a hail of arrows spell but that's we're talking about completely different scales of power mm-hmm. here yeah definitely um well and then the evasion and you know all that stuff just isn't set up to right. do something like that yeah and another area where D and D really falls flat is, and we'll talk about the fact that it's very combat focused in one of the future podcasts, but, um, there's not a lot of like options for soft magic in there either. Um, so you can't have kind of the broad, but, um, diffuse, diffuse magics that you might want. Right. Um, A good example of this is probably actually Gandalf, right? Like that, that, Ironically, th- even though D and D is basically an ersatz of Tolkien fiction, like the Jack Vance magic has it, it has pervaded, and now there is no way to do some kind of soft magic mm-hmm. system like what Gandalf, what Gandalf's magic looks like in the Lord of the Rings, yeah, or in the Hobbit. Yep. Another another example of this is probably a, another good one is Mistborn. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of really cool powers and cool interactions of powers in Mistborn. And like, I mean, it is almost Mistborn having been written by, um, fuck. Brandon Sanderson. Brandon Sanderson. I, I was going to call him like Barry Sanderson or something. <laughs> hey, God. Not quite. Um, by, by, uh, Brandon Sanderson is almost the trope codifier of Sanderson's laws. I think Naruto is the better codifier of Sanderson's laws, but regardless of that, um, the fact that like his his Sanderson's his implementation of those Sanderson laws in Mistborn is not really contiguous with the way D and D would treat those mm-hmm. things, right? Like you, those powers, the way they work in in Mistborn, are pretty different from how the, the you can't write those to work the same way in D and D. 
Which is why D&D was not the system chosen. Right. Well, I can't say that for sure, but D&D was not the system chosen when a Mistborn role-playing game was set up. Right. The Mistborn, more specific, yeah, the, the Mistborn role-playing game doesn't use D&D. &D. It, yeah. it uses something else. <laughs> yep. For good reason, because they knew that's not how it would go down. Right, yeah. And I think Sanderson's other big series, um, you know, Words of Radiance, like, there, it, that's also not possible within D&D. Right. &D. You just don't have the variety of magic and other um, things that would get you what you need for that. So those are our feelings about D&D &D and the design of the system. Um, keep in mind that we're approaching this from a narrativist point of view, but we do feel that these some of these issues also apply in a more general sense to people who are coming in D&D &D from a gamist perspective as well. Um, we like the system, but we feel that it's got some flaws that make it not the best fit for us. So this is actually part one of three. We're going to have two more podcasts where we're going to talk more about the uh, mechanics and the social aspects of D&D &D and our issues with those as well. Stay tuned. I'm Joe. And I'm Liz. This is Joe's Table signing off. See you next time, everybody. Bye, everyone. Peace. Thank you.